Hey everyone, welcome to this teaching from Christ Family Church. We hope that you enjoy. I'm glad that you're here today. My name's Ron Fisher. I am one of the ordained pastors here at Christ Family Church. <laughs> yes, and thank you for everyone that was able to be a part of that ordination service last Sunday. It truly is a blessing to serve you and our great and awesome God. So our denomination, we've talked a little bit about this and just about this, is this ordination. Our denomination, the Alliance of Reformed Churches, has established what I believe is a wise and versatile ordination process that not only brings people who are called and able to share the gospel, as well as live and teach his truths, but it also fills a dire need in our country. We, we've talked a little bit about this in the past. One in every four pastors in the next five years will retire. And in addition, since the pandemic, many pastors left the ministry, causing even more of a compounded need. For instance, our denomination has 11 churches just west of Cedar Falls here in Iowa. Eight of those churches are without a pastor right now. This new Pathways, which the program is called, allows individuals, again, who are called and able to bring to bear the experience and schooling that they already have, hopefully fill, fulfilling the core competencies and also achieving the other practitioner-level uh, areas. If a pastor has areas that he can improve in, and we all do, but I definitely do, uh, he can still have learning in in those areas. Now, our denomination, through our network, supports them with a team. Three. Three people. A guide, a coach, and a mentor. So they're not like ordained and they're sent off and, you know, pat it on the back. Hooray, we're in the, we're in the end zone. We're not going to walk with you. They do walk with you. Honestly, I cannot think of a better way to equip pastors and pastors in churches to spread the gospel here in the early 21st century. Now, speaking of our denomination, uh, this past week, Pastor Zachary and I had the opportunity to attend our denomination's first gathering. It was truly a beautiful time of worship, getting to know each other, and being equipped to do the work of spreading the gospel and enhancing the kingdom. As we have emerged from the challenges of our past, our denomination, and praise the Lord, solidly roots itself in our Father and His Word. So, it's very important that we come together to get to know each other better, and we had an amazing time in uh, Denver this past week. So, of course, Pastor Zachary left from Denver, and now he's out in Romania. Uh, if you're on social media, I'm sure you're going to get to see some of those uh, pictures. He actually preached this morning at a Baptist church uh, in Romania, so uh, you get a chance to see that. So here we, here back in uh, Davenport, Iowa, we're in the beginnings of a new series called Waiting Room. Now last week, Pastor Zachary preached on waiting on God. Now, and he asked me to remind you to continue to keep up unplugging for 10 minutes each day to spend time with God. I think that's really possible and I encourage you to do that. Now this week, we're going to talk, we'll be, we'll be covering waiting in suffering. In the coming weeks, we'll hear Pastor Zachary on formation and other topics. So he asked me a few months ago, as he was putting this uh, series together, uh, he asked me which of the topics I'd like. And um, crazy me, I picked suffering. Uh, you know, one of those really fun topics that everyone rushes to preach on in congregations, you know, they just sit on the edge of their seat waiting to hear about. Like you, I've been through difficult times in my life that I would say constitute as suffering. As sure as the sun rises in the east, it is sure to come. Unfortunately, most of us want to avoid it. Now you're saying to yourself, wait, what, what did he just say? Unfortunately, most of us want to avoid it? Unfortunately, yep. I believe that suffering plays a role in our salvation, 
and is critical to understanding the gospel. So it's really important. So this is what we're going to be covering today. So what will we learn today? Three things. Number one, suffering and the internal process that happens. Two, suffering, the external benefit. And then lastly, what is to come? Now, if you've got your bulletins there and you want to fill in the blanks, I just gave you the cheat sheet really early, okay? So you have lots of time to take notes. All right, so let's read from our passage today. And let's see. Oh, wait a minute. All right. I think I'm... There we go. All right, so we're in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 18. And uh, so let's read from our, uh, the, the scriptures of God's holy word. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised Lord, the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase our thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is re- being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Well, I didn't do very good at that, but you were listening, right? Okay. All right. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. you we wish for you to lead us into this topic This is something, Lord, as you know, every single person in this room has faced. And so, Lord, we ask that you would speak into our hearts. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing to you, O great God and holy heavenly Father. Work through me for this congregation and those gathered here, both near and far. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, we're going to talk about suffering, the internal process. Okay. The internal, what happens in us as an individual. Now, as we read these words that Paul wrote to us, it's almost like Paul is welcoming suffering. I believe he is, actually. And I think the key here is that he sees what's going on with suffering. Now, Paul was a man familiar with suffering. I'm going to bring up a list here. Lord willing, there we go. It's a little small, but this is, makes my point. Now, if you can read it, I'm going to read it to you. So this is what happened to Paul. He was whipped with 39 lashes five different times. Okay, I can't even imagine one. Okay? Beaten with rods three different times. Pummeled with stones, not, not just little pebbles, people, one time. Shipwrecked three times. Adrift at sea for an, a, a one night and one day. Danger from rivers, robbers, his own people, Gentiles. Danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Many sleepless nights, you can imagine. Hungry and thirsty, often, cold and exposed, and the pressure of anxiety 
for all the churches that he has equipped daily. Okay, big deal. A lot going on here. I, most of us have nowhere near experienced anything like that. And we really think we have it bad. Now, the interesting thing here is Paul is writing in this passage to people that uh, other people in some of the churches are saying, Paul can't be a man of God. If he was a man of God, all these bad things would not happen to him. Sounds like our society too. Our society likes to sit back and say, well, if you're a Christian, how in the world would, would all these bad things happen to you? Isn't God with you? We think upon our salvation that all of it's going to be a lot easier, our troubles are going to go away, and and honestly, we, we hope they will. But on the contrary, Paul says that his suffering, to go against these naysayers, his suffering is actually proof God is with him. So it's just the opposite of what society's saying. That's the way God works. Now, Paul's a lot like David. <laughs> you think about David. You talk about someone that could go from a mountaintop to a whiner in a minute. Look at David's life. Up against a giant, chased by a king, overthrown by a son, hounded on every side by enemies. But what does David say? In Psalm 119, he actually says, It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees good to be afflicted. What he's saying is that his suffering taught him about God and the true life that he gives. So Isaiah 53 uh, talks about our Savior. You know, you think, you talk about suffering, Isaiah actually pictures it even before he's born. Isaiah 53, 2 to 4 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our our pain. He bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. So this passage actually kind of reflects how we perceived what happened to him before our salvation. Oh my gosh, look at what happened to this guy. He was so beat up, so God couldn't be with him. But Jesus took up our pain and bore our suffering. What's our response before salvation? We considered him punished by God. Jesus, as we know live the ultimate life of sacrifice. If you've been a Christian for just even a little while, you can see his emphasis and what he sacrificed for us. And he calls you and I to that same life. Now, he doesn't say, seek comfort, the easy lane. The only person saying that, my brothers and sisters, is the enemy, not our Savior. So if he lived this life of suffering, mustn't there be a purpose behind suffering? I believe there is. And I hope that you too will see that as we continue this morning. So as we see from our passage today in 2 Corinthians, Paul understood that this life is one sorrow after another. And some of you are probably saying, yep, been there, done that, feel it, feeling it maybe. Maybe you probably realize that. Maybe you were willing to face that. But what do you do with it? In the past, our ancestors, even 100 years ago, were, very, were, not, were not surprised by death and sorrow. Our culture today is surprised by suffering. Paul says, don't be shocked. Everything is wearing away. <laughs> Every time I look in the mirror, I see that. That shiny new car you bought doesn't look too shiny anymore, does it? The paint job on your house looked good for a while. Looking a little dull now. But our hope is not in our body. 
Our hope is not in our car. Our hope is not in our house. Brothers and sisters, it is in Christ alone. Jesus showed us suffering and death brought resurrection and life. This is hope. This is our gospel. Now, death to resurrection, weakness to triumph and exaltation. It's kind of like um, when you're living life before you're, you knew Christ as your Savior, you were there, and then you, you, there may have been a period of suffering. You kind of fell off of where you were, and you realized you needed Christ. And then you died. You died. The old self died. And then you were raised by Christ. A good friend of mine always said, there can never be resurrection without a death. Death must come before resurrection every time. Now, Paul is saying that that from our passage today, that we who are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you too. As our old self dies, and I'm not talking about your physical body, I'm talking about the old man, the the sinful man, the sinful woman, we are constantly being brought to life in Jesus. Not just on the day we accept Christ, but every day we are continually transformed as we experience suffering and hardship over the true life in Jesus as we rely on him and become more like him each and every day. The truth is that Jesus, Jesus' life shows us it is his suffering, it is his death, and it is his resurrection that is our only hope. And his true and ultimate promise. He promises you. He promises you resurrection each and every day. He promises you resurrection when you die, your physical body stops. As you die, and each day and ultimately, he promises to bring resurrection to you. Now, look what he did with Paul. Okay. Now, this is a guy that persecuted the church and then was taught by Jesus. He suffered. And, okay, where did Paul end up? Okay, Paul ended up under house arrest. He went before uh, Caesar, and then he lost his head. Okay, we are told he was beheaded. But what came out of that? Paul wrote most of the New Testament that's in the Holy Scriptures this very day. It was Paul's transformation that ultimately blessed over 2,000 years of Christians. So what am I trying to say? It is your suffering that teaches you where you are and what's happening in you and how you can experience the suffering that transforms you through the hope in the gospel to resurrection. That is God's promise. It is Jesus, it's what Jesus came to bring. Which brings us to our second point. So we've seen how the first is an internal transformation or an internal uh, what's happening process inside of us. So we get to the external benefit. So our suffering is not only for our benefit, I know some of you may still be wondering if suffering is for our benefit. Let's also look at how suffering can benefit those around us. Paul says in Romans 5, 3 to 5, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. Do I know suffering? Yes. I found my dear great aunt passed away in her bed at the age of 13. I watched my dad slowly waste away from ALS also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And I've watched and experienced those who love me eventually turn away and leave. 
But all that, nothing compares to what happened to me in 2018. Let me tell you a little story about Ron Fisher. Back in 2018, my worlds collided and ultimately blew up. Things at the school I was the head of school at, my relationships, pretty much all of them, wife, children, friends, and then my past. So you have work, home, past, including this trauma from my youth, all collided. It was a perfect storm, a storm that could have only been orchestrated by God for my good. In October of 2018, I may have punched you if you told me this was going to be for my benefit. I felt like I lost everything. No job, relationships gone or disappearing, and I didn't know who I was anymore. Sleepless nights, anxiety, honestly, panic. That Ron was flailing around, trying to find a hold on the gods that couldn't satisfy. I tried to, tried to grab hold of, of all the things I had known, everything I had learned on how to cope with the world and my surroundings. I'd grab and nothing was there. I, no, nothing was hold. None of them could give me the relief that I was seeking. Why did why does it have to take all of that to change me? Now, there came a point where the old Ron had to die. Okay, so when I preach to you, when I tell you, there comes a point you have to get into this death. It's true. And when that old Ron died, the new Ron would be brought to life. It truly is the picture of immersion. Baptism that we had a few weeks ago. Those four believers... It is symbolic to the old life, the death, and the resurrection. Now, if you were there, you saw the joy, the renewal, and the new day in their eyes and the smiles, a new life in Christ. Now, at some point on, on my journey, but early on, thank God, God gave me this verse we read in Romans 5, those words, suffering, endurance, character, hope. Now, I knew that I was going through a lot. And when I pulled out of that deep self-pity, I was willing to grab a hold to God's promise through Paul. There was so that was something. Those words were something I could hold on to. Nothing like the things I looked to in the past that didn't satisfy. I needed endurance because it was really hard. I definitely needed character because I lacked a lot of it. And hope? I'll be honest, hope was foreign to me. So I, no, no, we, God and me, went on, embarked on this journey. I did learn endurance from suffering. I could see that, yeah, I could learn to endure through this suffering. God shaped some character out of that mess. And now I can sin, continue to pursue hope with his help. He, my brothers and sisters, has proved faithful and true. And he's not done. This was definitely not an overnight fix. It was five years. And in some ways, it still continues. Although the butterfly has emerged from the, coop, the, the cocoon, I believe he still has really just begun to stretch my wings, praise to God. Now, why do I bring this up? It's not to show you that I have suffered more than you or what I went through is more difficult than maybe what you've went through or may went go through. But I believe that out of death comes resurrection and out of weakness comes Christ's power. Paul says it in the passage. Paul says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardness, hardships, persecutions, calamities. Okay, Paul says he's okay. 
with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. For why? For when I am weak, then I am strong, Paul said. So I say to you, for me too, bring on the weakness. Embrace your weakness. Do not run from the suffering. Now, he called me back into ministry in 2021. And as he is glorified, he is giving me this family called Christ Family Church. He has brought about ministry in the community through what he has done in me. He is allowing me to counsel and lead others to life. Now, why do I do counseling? Because of the healing and renewal that I've received. It is through it I can help others with Christ through their suffering and help them find healing and renewing. I'm not perfect. I'm still learning. I'm still on this journey. I have prayed for five years, five years, pretty much daily, for reconciliation of relationships from 2018. And you know what? God's making a way even now. Did you know that an acorn, if you drop an acorn, that over time, that one acorn can fill a continent with trees? If you give it time, that's the truth. But what must happen first? The acorn must die. But out of that death comes endless strength, life. Out of the death of Christ comes endless strength, life, even life through, through the death and continued death of this guy. Paul tells us in Corinthians, after suffering, we can comfort others in suffering. So this is the external benefit. It, as you have gone through suffering, you can help others with suffering, not just your kids, not just your family, but your fellow believers, the people you know at work. When we know suffering and sorrow and do the hard work of waiting, okay, it's not an overnight fix, we can help others through us while they wait on the suffering to pass and see what God was up to in their life. My friends Kurt and DJ were there for me, and they got to help that acorn die in me. Brothers and sisters, you have much more potential than an acorn you have life, matchless life and strength through Christ if you only would believe in that. Surviving ordeals makes you far more valuable to other people for the kingdom. Believe the promise that Peter says to us in 1 Peter 5.10, after you have suffered for a little while, Christ himself will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So, we have internally, we learn to, that we, have, we, we die, we learn what Christ is going to do in us, and he brings us to life. We learn that that suffering we go through helps us help others. But let's look at our last point. What is to come? Is this all we have? So, if our suffering is momentary and light, what's our hope? And remember, this is an area that I very much desired to understand, and that's hope. And God's teaching me. Is there something after the disappointment, the difficulty, the trouble? How do we know all this works out? What's our assurance? Is it good work? Attending church your whole life? Being raised in Iowa in a Reformed church? Our hope is to believe that the resurrection happened and live the daily life of death and resurrection. These light and momentary troubles are nothing to compare to the glory of what will come. After the resurrection, after our physical death, the gospel engulfs suffering. It is greater than suffering. We know this because of the hope that we have. Heaven is not our hope. Okay, if you're looking forward to going to the clouds and strumming a harp, it's not where we end up, okay? Our new, our hope is the 
ultimate restoration, the new heaven and the new earth, this is our true hope in Christ and his resurrection. We get all of it back again, restored, transformed. All creation is waiting with, help, with his breath held, waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. The tragedy that you've been through makes the joy greater. The Bible makes it clear that the only way that Christ was able to show up at Jerusalem, you think about that, he knows what he's going to. Endure his extreme suffering, okay, off the charts of anything that normally would be done to someone that was about to be crucified, and then die for us was for the hope that was to come. What's that hope? You. He saw you on the other side, restored, resurrected, in an intimate, permanent, eternal relationship with God the Father. That was his hope. You were his hope, what was to come. And the only way this makes sense is that joy is greater than the cross. Joy is greater than your suffering, my suffering, hardship, your hardship, my hardship. Now look at our Savior. In Hebrews 12, 2, it says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame because being hung on a cross was shameful to the nth degree and is seated at the right hand of God, the throne of God. So why did Jesus go to the cross? To restore relationships with each and every one of you and to spend eternity with you An eternity that is greater than anything we can fathom. This is so hard to understand why Jesus would do this. Because we think of ourselves, we wouldn't do this. It's hard to understand how suffering helps you and other Christians, especially when you're going through the suffering. But But it helps both sides, the suffering transforms you, and you can help others. Joy engulfs suffering because of the cross. Joy absolutely undoes suffering. This is the promise of the gospel. And ladies and gentlemen, this changes everything in our lives. We can have joy today because of the cross, but our hope is in what's to come. Not this life, but what's to come. J.R.R. Tolkien the author of The Hobbit and The Lord of Rings, said and wrote, and I believe he demonstrates in his books, he says that there is a hope beyond the walls of our world. The Bible, the Bible rustles that everything eventually will not be so. Paul tells us what what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. There is more coming, more than you can ever understand or hope for. We can't fathom it. So the other day, I'm thinking, I'm writing this sermon, and I'm I'm thinking about this. I'm watching, uh, the other other day, my daughter and I were watching a Marvel movie called Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Okay, some of you may have seen it. Now, I'm not a big fan of this whole quantum universes thing. Uh, especially when some people these days feel like, oh, I, I messed up because I was in another quantum universe. No, no, no. Um, so, but, it, but this picture of this movie gives me the heart. There is way more to this world than we can see, the world that's to come. Sometimes, and I have no proof of this, I believe that we may be able to explore the vast unis- universes in our new bodies beyond the Milky Way. Maybe we get to explore an, a cell, an animal cell, like a teen, you know, that microscopic animal cell, like walking around a state park. That'd be pretty cool, right? Walking around, oh, look at that. What's that? That's mitochondria, you know. Um, or maybe we get to explore thought like a roller coaster or a beam of light like a great meal. I don't know, but isn't it great to dream and to hope? 
I want to conclude today by reading two passages from one of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis. Now, I believe that C.S. Lewis understood hope and the new heaven and the new earth, and he wrote about in a book called The Last Battle, which is part of the Chronicles of Narnia. So it's the last book in the Chronicles of Narnia. Most of you are familiar with uh, the uh, second book, which is The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. Okay, so that's the second one. Um, And then this is the last one. So I think that he pictures, he was an amazing Christian. Uh, some call him uh, the, great, the greatest Christian author of the 20th century. And what he writes to start in this book, he says, and he's talking about, you know, the, the kids and, oh, and by the way, in Narnia, there's talking animals and stuff like, okay, remember, it's a story. Um, but he writes this, he writes all of their life. So as they're at the end of this, they, this is the resurrection, this is the end uh, this is the end of the world, uh, and he writes, all of their life in this world and all of their adventures had only been the cover page and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. And this, he writes, now, again, we have to re- realize that there's, there's, there's King Tyrion, there's two children, there's a unicorn, uh, there's, uh, there's a donkey, and, of course, they all talk, and this, and this is the unicorn talking. Or, actually, this is uh, C.S. Lewis speaking about what they're going through. It's hard to explain how this sunlit land was different from the old Narnia, as it would be to tell you the fruits of that country taste, or how those fruits of that country taste. Perhaps you will get some idea of it if you think of it like this. You may be in a room in which there is a window, so picture this in your mind, that looked out on a lovely bay or of the sea or a green valley that winds through the mountains. And in the wall of that room opposite the window is a looking glass or a mirror. And as you turn away from the window and look at the looking glass, you suddenly caught the sight of that sea or that valley all over again in the looking glass. And the sea in the mirror or the valley in the mirror were in one sense just the same as the real ones, yet at the same time, they were different, deeper, more wonderful, more like places in a story, in a story you've never heard but very much want to know. The difference between that's the the difference between old Narnia was like that. The new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked as if it meant more. I can't describe it any better than that. If you ever get there, you'll know. It was the unicorn who summed up what everyone else was feeling. He stamped his right forehoof on the ground and neighed, then cried. I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I have been looking for my whole life. Though I never knew it until now. The reason why we love the old Narnia is that it sometimes looked a little like this. Come further up. Come further in. I believe that is a beautiful picture of what is to come, the new heaven, the new earth, and what it will be like. It will be nothing, it will be like nothing we could ever imagine. I believe that if we knew what it was like, it would overwhelm us in this condition we're in today. But Jesus, but Jesus is preparing a room for you in this place in that new heaven, and in that new earth. Brothers and sisters, dream and dream deeply of the hope that is in you. Do not forget it. He loves you very, very much. Let's pray. Hey, again, we hope that you enjoyed that teaching from Christ Family Church. Uh, We invite you to come visit us sometime in person. We meet every single week on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. 
And if you want more info about our church, we invite you to check out ChristFamilyChurch.org. Thanks again. Have a great week. Thank you.